At First Baptist Church, our mission is to follow our Lord Jesus Christ and to lead all others to a joyful life with Him. Our hope is that you will encounter Jesus Christ in such a way that you will have joyful news to go and tell. Let's stand together and read this passage from Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. <clears throat> What I am saying is that as long as the heir is a child, he is no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. But now that you know God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you are turning back to those weak and miserable principles? Do you wish to be enslaved by them all over again? You are observing special days and months and seasons and years. I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> Have you reached a place in your life at which you've thought that you'd have yourself more together by now? And I, I don't mean, you know, you forgot to get the right kind of glasses for the eclipse that Jimmy was talking about. I don't, I don't mean, I, I mean something far more pervasive than that. It's hard to admit that you feel discontent with your life. If you make that known, somebody might think you're being ungrateful for what you have. And then you would feel even worse because you would still feel discontent, but now you would feel like a petty, selfish, discontented person. Just layer upon layer, isn't it? Which would make you feel even more discontented. What if discontentedness is not a bug, but rather a feature, though? Is that possible? Could discontent in your life be evidence of something beyond what you've known so far? Something that would be good for you to discover? Could discontent even be God's spirit in your life saying, I know the plans I have for you to give you a hope and a future? Does it seem like I'm asking all these questions rhetorically? They are rhetorical, but they're also real. I'm asking these questions too about my own life. Discontent has been a very familiar presence inside of me. And discontent can feel very heavy and actually very sad. It can flip over into regret and even despair pretty easily. If you can relate, then we have some exploring to do this morning. The law of Moses functioned like scaffolding for the human spirit, enabling the development of a yearning for something more lovely than the world as it now is, and functioning to lift one up to get a glimpse of what an everlasting, completely safe, unthreatened, pain-free kind of life looks like. The language Paul uses comes from 
concepts that his first century hearers would have recognized. The raising of children in a wealthy household or a royal family in the Greco-Roman world. Tutors, guardians, conservators, you know, the kind of people you grew up with. Curators, supervisors, trustees, who educate and train and socialize and condition and acclimatize the children so that they become aware of their identity, their heritage, their forebears, and ultimately their purpose and destiny. And in all those years, the children have no practical power of their own. They lack practical standing because they are at the complete mercy of their caregivers. In a virtual sense, they have no more say over their lives than slaves. Unlike slaves, however, their circumstances of powerlessness were ordered toward a future in which they would receive power and wealth and standing. The work of the caretakers would build around the children a scaffolding that got them ready for their future life. And that scaffolding also produced a yearning which felt like a discontent. They wanted to get somewhere that they weren't yet. but it helped them get accustomed to the life that awaited them. You know, they would say, I want to drive the chariot now, or whatever first century kids would say. <laughs> but they're not ready for that life yet. That readiness is being built into, the, into them by their caretakers who gradually introduce to them what is to come. That scaffolding generates a yearning in those young lives for something more than what they now know, and it gives them a glimpse into the life that they've been born to live. That's how the law functions, Paul says here. One of the effects of that scaffolding process is the experience of discontent, a restlessness that longs for something beyond the world one lives in today. Discontent is at its core not boredom. It's not petty ingratitude. It's not a childish inability to sit still. It is a sense that more exists than you have yet experienced. That inside of you there is a purpose that will never fully unfold if things stay the way they are in your life. Discontent is actually a necessary a necessary part of how a human being grows in this world, but it is not a pleasant experience at all. Discontent is very uncomfortable. Sometimes it can lead to sadness and despair. People can go a couple of ways with discontent. They, they can begin to explore what that discontent is pointing them to. But that's also hard really hard. The other way that they can go is that they can begin to manipulate things to help them feel more comfortable. So with discontent, a person can say, I want to know what that discontent is pointing me to. Or the person can say, I think I'm going to dial down the discomfort right now because it's too much. <clears throat> That's easier in the short run but it doesn't answer the most profound questions that discontent raises. Questions like, what is good? What is true? What does this universe mean? What is the purpose of life? That manipulation path in which one manipulates things to turn down the discontentedness, that manipulation path is what some of the most influential leaders in first century Judaism chose. The pharisaical tradition devolved into something that was treating the law not as a means to an end, but as an end in itself. It caused too much discontent to explore what it was pointing them to, and so they just became experts in how to live with the law. 
The law became the purpose instead of something that points to the purpose. But no one, or almost no one, listening today has a cultural history that involves the Mosaic Law of Judaism. I mean, this is a Christian congregation, so we're not going to have a history of Pharisaical Judaism hanging over our heads. So what can Paul say to you here? Well, your discontent doesn't come from the law of Moses, per se. These days, it comes from God's Holy Spirit that says to you that you were made for more than you've known. That activity of the Holy Spirit will lead you to experience discontent with the status quo in your life. The purpose of that discontent is to lead you to, to seek what is real and true and eternal. But just as influential Pharisees perverted the law of Moses in Paul's day, influential voices in the present day have responded to that Holy Spirit produced discontent by perverting it, saying to you that the answer to your discontent is to live up to this or that standard, to be good enough or nobody will love you, not even God. The discontent that you have experienced in your life is not a voice that says you're worthless, but a voice that says you're more valuable than you know. That discontent is the voice of the Holy Spirit calling you towards Christ. But the world has perverted the message of that discontent because it's hard to bear. And it has taught you to interpret it as a powerful and terrifying belief that you'd better figure out how to matter or you will never find welcome with anyone and certainly not with God. Now into that messed up circumstance comes an explosive revelation. The news is good. Paul says, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman born under law to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. Formerly, when you did not know God, you were slaves to those who by nature are not gods. The news is good. It's better news than you could have hoped. God has been at work the entirety of history to turn your experience around. Just at the moment the human race could tolerate it, the Son of God was born human into the circumstances of his fellow humans. His humanity was the way that he became the focal point of the full deadly power of sin, the target of that deadly power, directing it away from the rest of the human race. With that deadly power of sin now neutralized, we are freed up to the Spirit proclaiming that we are God, to hear the Spirit proclaiming that we are God's offspring, as Paul points out in Acts 17. Our rightful heritage is that of daughters and sons of God. It's a shocking moment to hear that, being, that, that far from being rejected by God, He's calling you back to your connection with Him as His child. You've been trying so hard to become worth loving, longing for others to welcome you, afraid that everybody up to and including God had rejected you all of your life. You have been crying out for someone to accept you. And it turns out God is crying out for you. He sends His Spirit into our hearts, and it cries out, Abba, Father. All your life you've been crying out for someone to accept you, and it turns out God is crying out for you. Can you believe that? It's so good that it's almost unbelievable. In fact, many people don't believe it. The news is hard to take. 
Of course it is. How could it not be hard to take? It goes against everything you've ever experienced in the world. You might have heard that God loves you as is, and you would love for that to be true, but what if it's not true? I mean, you've noticed how things actually work on the ground here in this life, haven't you? Nothing works like that. What if it's not true that God loves you as is? You want it to be true so bad. But what if it's not true? No matter if you're young or old, you've been around long enough to know what you've got to do to be accepted by people. And then that experience is going to carry over into how you perceive God regards you. You hear Paul talk about how God calls you his child. You long for that to be real. You long to be taken in and lovingly embraced by God, but you get so afraid that it's not real. Why wouldn't life with God function like a meritocracy in which you receive only what you achieve? You receive only what you merit. Everything else works that way. Even the church can promote that kind of system often by communicating subtle forms of favoritism. I mean, Paul talks about that to the Corinthians. Or by shaming people, or by ignoring pain, or perpetuating harmful stereotypes, or by marginalizing folks. So just in case God does operate by a meritocracy, even though you hope he doesn't. Just in case, it can seem safer to try to gain favor with God, to, be good and to try to be good enough with God by working really hard to be worthy of love. It's a slavish system. You work and you work and you're, you're still no better off than a slave. That leads nowhere. Paul mentions to the Galatians that even religious traditions that are meant to make life richer become, for some, a hamster wheel of endless effort. And then it really gets dark for you. Once you're in that, once you go down that rabbit hole, that feeling of despair and trying to be good enough for God, that feeling doesn't stay confined to religious activity. You also experience that feeling of despair in everything, the feeling that you just don't have what it takes to accomplish what you had hoped for in life. You haven't been good enough or strong enough or smart enough, or you have failed as a parent, or you have failed to find love, or you thought you, have, you would have just been past all these fears by now, so you must be a weakling and a coward after all. You can feel like you're trapped in some kind of cul-de-sac. You keep driving around it faster and faster, but you can't find the exit. You don't know how to break out of that dead end. This is what happens when you depend on your own effort to gain favor with God. It becomes a way, it becomes a, a cycle of trying to gain favor with God and then it expands to trying to gain favor with everybody else. It's a cycle that diminishes in its power to give returns to you. And eventually, you run out of energy. You can't do it anymore. That's where some people just shut down. Maybe that's you. You've tried to be good. You've tried to be acceptable. You've done everything the preacher said. Everything your parents told you was important. Everything church folks have valued. Everything your circle of friends were swearing by. But nothing has brought you contentment. Nothing has told you that everything is going to be okay. This is a hard place to land, and with some, it can get life-threatening. You just don't want to live anymore. With others, it can begin to seem that God isn't even real, but rather a story somebody has used to scare you into obeying the rules of life. Well, that's pretty dark. And then into that darkness... Paul comes to you very tenderly here. He wraps up this passage, not with scolding, but with a gentle reach. 
that says, you still matter to me. This is Paul saying this. You still matter to me and I still want you to live with this Savior who found me at a dead end. Paul himself was trying so hard to prove he had what it takes to be the most brilliant, most zealous law keeper in the history of his people. He kept cranking that machine until Stephen's death began to unravel his world. He'd never seen, Paul had never seen anybody die like that. And Paul was right there watching it all go down. He'd never seen anybody stand in the face of his accusers in that way. And he saw this man die and it was unlike anything he'd ever seen. And so you know what he did? He doubled down on his persecutory mission as if to quiet all the rising discontent in his soul. But it didn't quiet it down. And so he became even more ruthless. And just at the right time, Jesus said, Boy, it's really hard for you, isn't it? That was a thunderbolt of love from which Paul never recovered. The God who met him on that road to Damascus is the God he never knew he was longing for. But he was longing for that kind of God because everything else was killing him. It's funny. The man he saw die was more alive than Paul had ever been. And that day, confronted by Christ, Paul knew that was the God. This was the God who already loved him. The God who loved him before all his scholarly work before all his hyper-Phariseeism. And for the rest of his life, Paul went on a mission to tell that good news, that the God you hope for, but almost don't even dare to admit you hope for that God, is the God who really is. Because Paul knew from then on that the God we all long for is the one who says to us, I want you as you are not as you're trying so hard to be. If you've ever wanted to hear the words, you're trying so hard to show everybody that you're enough, but I know you're already enough. If you've ever longed for somebody to tell you that, then this is your moment. This is what Paul is telling you right now. And he's not just theorizing. He's telling you what Jesus told him. And even before that, it's what Jesus told Martha, his dear friend. Martha, the house is really clean. We could eat off the floor. You don't have to work so hard. Look at Mary, she's not doing anything. And I'm just fine with that. It's what he's telling you right now. Paul speaks in a restorative voice to you when he says, I fear for you that somehow I have wasted my efforts on you. That's not a scold. It's a reach. With these words, Paul is saying, I've been so distressed for you. So worried, you, you matter to me so much. And I was afraid that something had come between us. And Paul is speaking in concert with the spirit that he talks about crying out in our hearts. He's crying out, Abba, Father. He's saying, you, 
You matter so much to me. Paul is saying that. The Spirit is saying that. Paul says, if I can see how much, if I can see how much you matter, just think how much God sees that you matter. You're still made for more. You haven't forfeited your destiny. It's not too late. Just because you exist, you're enough for God to love you. And some people take that and they say, don't, don't say that because people might think you say you're enough uh, to save yourself. They can say that if they want. People are always going to say that. But listen, you need to hear that God considered you worth dying for. He made you and he pronounced you very good. And all of the sin is going to kill you. And God says, you come to me and I'll remind you what you were made for. Just because you exist, you're enough. The God you've longed for is really the God who is. This is the wonderful grace of God that he has placed in you a longing to find someone so beautiful and loving and desirous of living with you that you will search your whole life to find that kind of welcome somewhere. It's what you're doing now. And when you encounter God, you will know that he's the one you've been longing for your whole life. It's no coincidence that the one you've been looking for is God, exactly. It's because God has made you to live with Him. It turns out the God you hope is real is the God who really is. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit,